Yes. It's connected. PGA, yeah. So, for as many of us who see here in the room, some who started his career by studying glasses, stained glasses, or more particularly these stained glasses. And then, after some couple of years, he realized that it's much more fun, actually, to export. So, not so the goods uh, are the so. metals, and, he's, and you know, the <coughs> export target is different fields. So, his research interests and works, you know, touch things in, in fields as diverse as signal processing and data analysis and information theory, machine learning, statistical inference, you know, probability statistics, and I could probably go on for a while. Now, in physics, what we mostly care about is understanding. We want to understand what's going on in our system. Right? Now, when you come to the people from these fields, like real people from these fields, not just other physicists being interested in those <coughs> fields, they actually don't care so much about understanding. What they care about are two things, algorithms and proofs. And on the algorithm side, you know, we realize that, yes, the physics that we know can actually also be used to design algorithms. So when Ludo is, you know, talking about magic and not specifying what it is, well, there are whole communities of people developing these algorithms. So that's one of the directions into which Flora was venturing. And when it comes to the proofs, there it also gets interesting because, you know, we have this baggage of methods, including, for instance, the Bastica method that gives us some results and predictions that are very explicit, but not rigorous. And so when you come to talk to these people, they either don't care or you basically have to apologize. You know, I'm bringing this result. I'm sorry, it's not rigorous. I don't have the proof, but nevertheless, I think it's interesting. And there it comes interesting because doing that for a while, well, then he realized also that it's not actually so so far ahead to provide the proofs. And so, you know, thanks to recent <coughs> of works that he will also tell you about, we don't need to apologize anymore in large part for using this Rastika method and presenting it to our mathematician fields. And you can ask him about a bunch of other things like hardware based on some optics that is doing machine learning with the speed of light, in which he's also interested. And I could, okay, I could give the lecture, I suppose, but I should have <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, thanks. Okay, I have a lot to tell you about, apparently. Um, so don't worry about slides. I just start with five minutes of slides because I want to do an experiment uh, to show you that you know I used to be a physicist. Um, so the hard part here, as you, you know, they asked me to speak about a lot of stuff. Okay, so at the beginning, our beloved organizer asked me, tell us about inference and machine learning. Okay, I mean, in, in the last few days, this has evolved into that. Um, so this is my program, in case you are wondering what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I guess all this, hopefully in a you know, in more structured way. Anyway, uh, I started to panic at some point. So, uh, wh what am I going to do? So first, a disclaimer, right? And when I started to think, how do I plan my lecture here? Uh, this is what the organizer told me. Okay, this is sort of what I would like to do, which is... Anyway, to tell you some connection between the sort of glassy stat mech that you have been hearing and statistical estimation, statistics problem. Okay, so this is the plan. Um, and this is what I'm going to do. A really small part of it. Um, but I hope it will be interesting anyway. Okay, so before starting, uh, a few things you might want to know. Uh, notes. I have all notes in PDF. So... Uh, I give you this nice uh, Google short URL. So this is a you know, PDF that was written by some students and collaborators for another lecture. I mean, it's not exactly the same. It's rather different, but still, uh, there is a significant overlap, so you might find this useful. There is a recent review uh, from our beloved organizer and myself, which you can find on archive. I hope I got it right. Uh, 15, 11? Yeah, well, hopefully it's a good one. I mean, otherwise you can Google the title. And uh, because I think that you guys are, you know, you are having too much fun. I heard a lot of you went uh, to do some uh, hiking and everything. So, uh, you know, I think that you need to, to be given more exercise to keep you busy. <laughs> so uh, th these are uh, exercises that uh, we, we I wrote last week. They are in uh, the software overleaf. So it's in LaTeX. If you find the typo, you can change it. 
And again, instead of sending you uh, the overleaf uh, link, you can just write this and it should send you directly to, uh, to uh, the browser, I mean to, to, to the right page. Okay? So I wrote already some exercise for lecture one and lecture two, and there will be some uh, fun stuff with replicas and uh, information theory and statistics and uh, first order transitions and a lot of stuff. Okay? So I feel glad at this point that I went after Chris and also after Guillaume, because you already learned a, a lot of stuff. But, you know, I mean, I will assume that you were not there, and I will probably repeat a lot of stuff that you already heard, but as Guillaume point, pointed out, it's error correction and pedagogy. All right, let's start. Okay, so lecture one. I have learned that you have to give numbers and titles, so lecture one, and it's called denoising, like the process of removing noise, and statistics. Okay, so already we could probably fill 20 hours of lecture on these two topics. Uh, I could, and I don't know much about it, so imagine someone who actually knows something about it, he could you know, give you a full semester about this. Uh, so instead of um, going chronologically, I will jump directly to an interesting case and we'll try to show that it's connected with everything you've heard so far. All right, so this is a problem. This is a signal. Okay, these are 200 numbers. They are all zeros, except one, which is equal to one, which is this one, the number 100, okay? So people in, uh, uh, not statistics, not information theory, sorry, there are too many fields. Signal processing, thank you, Lenka. They call this a sparse signal. By that, they mean that it's a vector and most of its components are zeros. In fact, here, not only most, but all of them except one. Okay? Now, imagine that this is an interesting thing that you want to measure, but instead what you see is something like this. Okay, so this signal, this vector, plus you know, random noise, which here was uh, generated randomly IID from a Gaussian distribution. Okay? All right, I'm giving you this to you, and I'm asking you, can you recover the original signal? Okay? And the answer is yes. yes, right? And what would you do? You would say, well, you know, I will just keep the maximum and everything else I threshold to zero. Okay, so this algorithm is called the thresh uh, hard thresholding, and indeed this is what you should do. Okay, but that was a bit too easy. All right, then giving you another version. Okay, now I'm not telling you where the spike was. So I did exactly the same. I started with a spike. So everything's zero except one spike. I'm not even telling you if the spike was plus one or minus one. Could be both. And I added random noise. Okay, now we are 300 uh, values. One of them is my spike. And uh, I, I have added random uh, noise coming from a Gaussian distribution with variance uh, one half. All right, so now can you tell me which one was the spike? There was a yes. Okay, this one? 122? Okay, that one, for instance. Could be. Uh, let's try to make another realization with lower noise, okay? So this is noise 0 0.3. Anyone's feelings? Look, I'm paying a beer. Two beer. <laughs> two beers. <laughs> but the one who's losing is paying me two beers. Okay, which one? No? All right, so let's decay the noise. 0 0.2. Right, anyone feeling lucky? And maybe this one or this one. All right, so 0 0.15. Let's decay again, 0 0.12. That still looks very messy, right? I mean, at this point, uh, you know, no one will make a... All right, let's decay, 0 0.09. All right, now maybe you feel lucky. Okay, for instance, uh, that one, that one, that one, and that one, that looks promising, maybe this one. Okay, anyone is willing to make a bet? Right? Who, who thinks this is, this, this is a spike? Right? You think this is a spike? Is this a yes? 
you know where the spike is. So <laughs> right? Maybe that is the spike. All right, let's decay. Noise is entirely Gaussian idea. Yeah. Signal is zero and one spike, which is ever plus one or minus one somewhere. Plus noise, when I added some random noise. All right, let's decay again, 0 0.09. Ah, I think we have two winners there. I have seen the hand of the Montpellier people uh, raised before. I mean. Okay, let's decay again. All right, now it's clear, right? Okay, so something seems to happen basically around here, 0 0.21 or 0 0.09 or something. Okay? So it seems to be observing something of that sort, right? I mean, if the noise is, the variance is small enough, then it seems that, well, it's this guy, so we might as well put everything else to zero, and we have done a good job. When the, small, when the noise was large enough, when well, we were basically you know, stuck and there is nothing we could do. Okay, so this is definitely looking like a phase transition. And um, before to tell you that, you know, uh, where it comes from. This is not just words I'm playing with you. I mean, this is an actual denoising algorithm. Uh, this is coming from an article from uh, David Gono and uh, Jan uh, Johnstone, I think. It's called the Universal Thresholding. And, uh, okay, maybe you cannot see here, but th that was a picture which was with noise. Then I went into the wavelet basis, which you can think of as a Fourier basis, if you want. And when you go into this basis, you have basically a lot of peaks and something that looks like random noise. So you put everything below a certain threshold at zero, then you invert, and you come back, and this is a very good denoising algorithm. Okay, it used to be a very good one. And now people can do much better work. Okay, so it's just it's not just words. Okay, it's, it's actually a very interesting phenomenon. I'm sorry? Ah, uh, well, there are prescriptions for this. No. Anyway, I don't want to go into this. Okay? That's one of the things that I could speak, f well, people else, other people could speak about this for a while. So I don't want to go into this, okay? I want to come back to this problem instead. Because, you know, if we are physicists, how are we going to analyze this picture? It's called LENA, by the way. It's a very famous picture in uh, signal processing. So let's look at this phenomenon and see if we can understand what is going on here. And let's see if it reminds you of something, okay? So, a simple example. All right, let's see what is going on. So we have one peak, which is the good one, which is essentially at one or plus minus or, or minus one. Well, you have some noise, but you shall, uh, as you shall see, delta is actually small, so you don't perturb too much the spike, okay? So we would like to know what is the kind of values we are expecting everywhere, everywhere else. You know, what is the distribution of all these values here? So let's say that our signal has a length n. Okay, so we have n peaks, if you want. Now, you might ask a question like, imagine if I repeat this many times, and I draw many realization of this random process where I uh, generate this random noise randomly from a uh, IID Gaussian. How many peaks will have a value between W and W plus delta W? Okay? So on average, it's easy. Okay, this number is just, well, it's a number of peaks times the probability that a given peak has a value between W and W plus uh, uh, delta W. And since this is taken from a Gaussian distribution, it's something like this. Right? 
Now, since we are all physicists, we don't like quantities which are outside an exponential. Okay, so that would be the same as, let me forget about this and this. Okay, now we should start to ring a bell. Where I have defined omega tilde equal to omega divided by square root of log of the number of peaks. Now there is something interesting. If The absolute value of W root tilde is larger than square root of 2 delta. The average number of such peaks is decaying like an exponential log n with a negative number. So when log n is large, right, this number is going to 0. Well, as n is going to infinity. What does this mean? This means that when you do that kind of problem, okay, on average, the number of peaks that will have a value larger than, well, let me put back the log. So this means that the number of peaks with value Right, the number of peaks with values larger than 2 delta log of n is very small. On expectation, it's going to 0. And if you remember, there is this thing called Markov inequality that tells you that if something is going in expectation to 0, then the probability that it is occurring at all is also going to 0. Okay? So that means that when you do that kind of process, if you do a vector which is large enough, you will basically never ever observe a peak with a value larger than 2 delta log of n. Now, does this remind you of something? Okay, I'm I would be really worried if it doesn't. When, do we when have we seen exactly the same thing with different notation? Yeah, but you cannot answer that. All right, come on, anyone? It was like the first day, I think. Or Okay, if instead of working with n here, I would have something which is 2 to the n, and if this thing would be n like that here, and I would say, oh, I have 2 to the n different configuration, and their energy is random, it's taken from this distribution, and now I'm asking what is the probability of having a very low distribution, and then I would say that, oh, this is the entropy, and I will draw something like this, and I will convince you that this is a typical entropy, but, no, sorry, the average entropy, but it's also equal to the typical entropy and blah, 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 blah. That should remind you of one lecture, which is the one from Giulio Biroli. This is exactly the random energy model with different notation, okay? In fact, if you want to go to the random energy model, the dictionary is this n should be 2 to the n, where n is the number of spin, and delta, I believe, should be and divided by 2. And then you have exactly the same analysis. It's exactly the same. Right, so I remind, I remember that when Julio presented this to you, many asked, oh, why are you presenting this model? Okay, and he said, well, you will see it's useful. So he tried to tell you that it was useful for glasses. This morning, uh, Guillaume Semerger also presented you something very close, which was called the Random Code Ensemble, which was introduced by Shannon. This very similar analysis. And you can see that you can, you know, you recover the same kind of model here. Okay? Now, this transition, the fact that if you count the number of peaks, in our case divided by log n, asymptotically, those generated by random, they have to be between... Uh, yeah, I mean, so. Uh, 
number which have value delta tilde and they are between square root of 2 delta and square root of minus okay so that means by chance you never get anything smaller than minus square root of 2 delta or something larger than square root of 2 delta so if you observe something here that means that was the peak I put by hand at the beginning okay so if I look at this this is suggesting me an algorithm what I should do is that knowing that my transition that the peak I put at the value 1 all right so if I know that the peak the non-random peak at value 1 then I should look when delta is equal so when the threshold is equal gives me 1 so okay and this is telling you that the transition in noise should be given by 1 over 2 log of n and if you put 300 here which was the number of uh, value in my vector okay so with n it's called to 300 this is essentially 0 0.09 okay so this analysis is somehow valid at large n but it still gives something good because this is more or less where we observe the transition right so this is a simple example but I, uh, I, I hope it's showing you that there is a deep connection between that kind of problem and the kind of thing that we do when we do this stat make problem with random uh, energies and everything right so just to give you some reference this is coming from this paper by uh, Donohoe and Johnson minimax estimation at wavelet shrinkage and they call the threshold here the universal threshold in denoiser ok and as I told you it's pretty much connected with this work by Bernard Derrida in 81 which is a random energy model and in fact it's also connected to this, uh, what Claude Shannon did in 48 ok so the random energy is everywhere All right, so that's lesson number one. You know, that kind of problem that we see in spin glasses, they are everywhere and they are, I hope, I convinced you, they are interesting. Um, and I think I will stop here with the slides. All right, how do I remove this? Should be some. Uh, thank you. All right, so I hope I convinced you that there is something interesting uh, at the inter interaction between the two fields, okay? Now, there is something that was very interesting here was the occurrence of a phase transition. When the noise was large enough, there was no way I could find back the spike, okay? When it was small enough, it was easy. So we have some of a transition in the language of that was used by Chris between an easy problem when the variance of my Gaussian noise was smaller than the critical value and an impossible one when the variance was larger than my critical value okay so this is really a phase transition in, in, in the physics language and the goal of this lecture is to tell you about phase transition in these estimation problems in examples which are maybe more interesting than this uh, even though this is interesting but maybe more involved and uh, that make use of all these things that you have learned uh, so far and you will see that we will go very close to uh, the spins model that have been discussed in the context of glass transition yeah yes Yeah, if you want. I mean, this is really some extreme value statistics when you pick up a, a large bunch of random uh, Gaussians. I think so. In fact, I think, uh, I believe Gerard Benarus will discuss much more involved stuff uh, with, uh, with this kind of, uh, of problem uh, later in the fourth week or the third week. I don't know. All right. So 
let's move to something maybe more interesting. Well, I don't know if it's more interesting, but a bit more principal. Okay, and I, I, I want to do computation. I want to do explicit computation. Okay, I want to give you an example. So, what I want to do now is another problem of denoising. Well, I want to denoising to denoise a single variable. Okay, I want to do this because I want to build up some theoretical tools before we move to more interesting stuff. Okay? So the more interesting stuff will be really spin glassy. Or glassy if you want. There are not, there are not so much spins here. Um, but we need to start somewhere and uh, this is a good place. So imagine the following uh, situation. Okay? You have a random variable x, which you want to know, and it is taken from a distribution p of x. Okay, and I will uh, do like Guillaume, I will call the random variable big x, and small x will be one realization of the random variable. Right, so we know this probability. For instance, maybe this random variable is plus one with probability one half, and minus one with probability one half. Okay? So someone is picking up this random variable from this probability distribution. So this side of the room, for instance, is rolling a dice and is deciding, okay, it's plus one. Okay? Now they want to send the information on the other side of the room, and now I will use the same kind of language that Guillaume did. But of course, you know, everything is noisy, we learn there are a lot of problems, and uh, the other side of the room is hearing uh, badly, and they hear something which I will denote as a random variable. Why? And it will be equal to square root of lambda times. So let me say that the true value is x star, okay? Right, so this is what you hear. Lambda is just a number, and this is another random variable, which I assume to be Gaussian. Okay, so those guys are picking up a random variable. They roll a dice, okay, it's plus one. Then they send it through a channel, to speak like Guillaume. And this channel, what it's doing is that it's multiplying this random variable by square root of lambda. Okay, lambda is a name. It's called the signal to noise ratio. Or SNR. Okay, I mean, if lambda is large, then what you receive is larger than the noise, so clearly it's good. If lambda is very small, it's not good because the noise is larger than uh, the signal, so it's really signal to noise, right? So if lambda is zero, for instance, you just receive random noise. Very bad. If lambda is one billion, well, essentially you receive S plus one billion, plus a random noise which is of order one, or minus one million, plus a random noise order one. So that's going to be easy. So the interesting thing is what happens between lambda zero and lambda infinity. Okay? So this is called AWGN channel. So this is, this stands for additive white Gaussian noise. And it's another channel, uh, which is actually used a lot in the information theory and error correction uh, as well. I mean, it's another different stuff. I mean, you heard about the binary erasure channel, the binary symmetric channel, and people like to, uh, to use this one. Actually, this is a very good model. It's, it seems like very simple, but for instance, for deep space communication, this is what is used. It's really uh, apparently a good model. And also for uh, wireless communication. Yes, Marilou? Good point. So, this guy is drawn from P of X. That guy from a normal distribution with zero mean and unit variance. Okay, so it's a Gaussian. So, who is familiar with this notation? Yeah, but... <laughs> Were you familiar five minutes ago? Okay, good. So, we'll use it. Okay? Now, I will not do, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not here to discuss error correction. Uh, there will be an exercise about this, but uh, 
I want to discuss what you do when you receive Y and you want to know what X star was. Okay. Now it's not the same as error correction. Error correction will be telling you, okay, don't send X star. Just make first a code book and do something clever so that when I measure Y, I could look up the table or run an algorithm and find for sure X star. Okay? But this is not what we do here. When you do statistic estimation, you cannot devise anything. It's just the problem. This is what you have been given. You are lucky enough to know this thing. In, in fact, in most of the problems, you actually don't even know this function, so <laughs> it's hard. You are lucky enough to know the process. And in fact, in most problems, you don't even know the process, so <laughs> it's also hard. So we are in a good situation. I'm telling you the distribution with that I used to generate uh, the signal. I'm telling you how I generated the random perturbed uh, measurement that you get. And the goal is now, given y, to find a very good estimate of x star. OK? So that would be an algorithmic problem. And another goal, which would be interesting, would be to compute analytically what is the best thing you can do under such things. Right? If you, you, you will tell me, well, uh, if lambda is 10, I know that on average I can get x star up to uh, you know, 90% or something like this. That would be the kind of thing we would like to do. So these are two different goals, right? One is some more information theoretical. That's the best thing I could do. Now I'm connecting with what Chris said. And the other one is algorithmic. Okay, what to do in practice. Okay, even though in practice there are a lot of other problems. Okay, uh, Good. So, there is one instance where it's very easy to, do, uh, to solve this problem, and this is not what I'm going to talk about, but I will mention it now because you, know, you might have heard of it. And this is the case in which case A, uh, sorry, so we have B, uh, B1. Okay, imagine that you received many measurements. So that is, imagine that you are receiving y1, which is equal to what, square root of lambda x1, uh, x, so there is only one, a single x star, plus z1, then y2, which is square root of lambda, the same x star, plus z2, and so on and so forth, until yn equals square root of lambda, plus zn. Right, so imagine that you can repeat this experiment. Right? X star is, for instance, 1, and you receive many, uh, let's say that lambda is 1, so what you are receiving is a bunch of numbers with a Gaussian distribution with variance 1 and mean 1. So if you take the mean, you expect that you will find the correct uh, thing, right? So in this case, and this will be exercise 1, uh, there is actually a very simple way uh, to solve that kind of problem, and in fact, pretty much any problem like this, right? If you have really high number of observation, this problem is easy, which is kind of intuitive, of course. And uh, let me tell you uh, how. So first of all, when I wrote this, you see that I defined y as a random variable condition on the value of x star, okay? And what it y, y is doing is just multiply x by x and adding random noise. So the probability to observe y given x is just, uh, I will switch to. Okay, so by the way, this is a conditional entropy, okay? It's probab probability to observe y given x. And it's a function of the two variables, y and x. It's a conditional probability, sorry, not entropy. Okay, it's just uh, square root of lambda x minus um, y squared divided by 2 square root of 2 pi. Okay? This is just the mathematic translation and probability of that. 
Now, if I received many values, many values y, ah. all right, sorry about that. So if I receive many value of y, I can define a vector, okay? Value y1 until y n. And now, probability to observe the vector y given x, I depend on all these values and on x. Well, it's just a product. Simple enough. Uh, yes. Correct? And it's very simple, but it still leads, you know, it, lead, it, it will lead to something very interesting. I believe this one doesn't move, right? <laughs> okay. That's fine. Yeah, we'll move here. Okay, so there is one way that always works. And this the way is to maximize this function and to find the x that maximizes this function. So this has a name. Right? So first notice, this is a probability distribution on y, not on x. Okay? If I integrate this over x, it doesn't give one. It's not a probability di distribution over x. First remark. Okay? Still, people like this kind of stuff. And so p of y given x, if you consider it as a function of x indexed by y, it's not a probability, but it has a cute name, people like it, the likelihood. Right? Now, one way to solve the following, one way to solve this kind of problem is to say that your estimator, this is the way people speak in statistics, so your estimator of the unknown y, a value x, is given by the value x that maximizes the log likelihood, the likelihood. So I will call I will call this estimator x hat underscore ml because it stands for maximum likelihood. All right. So exercise one, which I'm not giving to you, is to prove that when n is large, this is always giving the correct solution. That is that x hat is converging to the unknown value x that you used to generate the data. Okay, so this is exercise one. I'm not giving you uh, too much clue. We have to do it. It's very simple. It uses some of the things you have seen so far, like the schoolback library, uh, uh, differential entropy, and, uh, and such. It's a few lines. And um, let's see what it gives in our case. First of all, maximizing the probability. Okay. This thing is just a product of the dependent probabilities. Yes? Yes. Thanks. The likelihood. Which is a conditional probability of y given x. Okay? So maximizing this is the same as maximizing the product of the individual probability on uh, all the yi. Maximizing a product is the same as maximizing the log of the product, but maximizing the log of the product is the same as maximizing the sum of the logs. Okay? So in our case, this is arg max 
of sum over i square root of lambda x minus um, y i squared divided by uh, 2, I believe, plus a constant that will not be interesting. Okay, and if you try to, to find the x that maximizes this expression, let's see, it should be uh, x hat should be 1 over n uh, sum of the y i divided by lambda. Right, let's see, if we derive this thing, uh, we see that we have to ma maximize the sum of uh, this thing. Uh, yes, it works. Uh, now you might complain that this is exactly what you would have done without all this focus focus, and that's a trivial thing to do. And I agree. That is a trivial thing to do because the noise is just Gaussian, so it's simple. I mean, you are just doing a mean of what you receive, okay? But as you will see in exercise one, this is always working, at least when n is going to infinity. You can show that this is converging to x star. Okay, so by the way, this is due to Fisher, who is called, uh, with, you know, kind of the inventor of modern statistics, and this is, uh, 1912, maximum, li maximum likelihood. But if you, you know, dig enough, and since I'm Frenchman, I need to tell this, you realize that Laplace uh, actually did this uh, century before. And Gauss, but I'm not German, so I will mention it Laplace. Okay, Laplace is one of the really of the very huge name in statistics, and uh, you realize that he invented many things. Okay, this is fine, but this is fine if you are in this situation, that you have many measurements of the same thing. Okay, this is what we do in physics most of the time, and this is the way we average measurement, right? We repeat 12 times the experiment, we divide by 12, then we know how to estimate the error, I mean, that's the kind of thing we do. Okay? But it's interesting that it works, and notice that you are never using at any point here the knowledge that you knew what was the probability distribution of x in the first place. You're not even using this, and it works anyway. Okay? And it works because you have an infinite, well, an infinite, a very large number of measurements. Fine, so let's move to a more interesting case and maybe more challenging. B2, only one measurement. All right, what do we do then? Well, in this case, we will be totally stupid not to use the knowledge of this function. Right? That will be totally stupid. Okay, so now I'm going to again uh, repeat some of the stuff Guillaume has said. And, uh, um, and tell you what is the big way, I mean, there's a big hammer here which is coming from a trivial fact, which is the probability of event A and B happening together, this is called the joint probability of A and B, can be written as a probability that B is happening when A is happening times P of A is happening, right? Probability that it rains and I have an umbrella is a probability that it actually rains and that I have an umbrella when it rains. Now, of course, since A and B plays the same role, you can write it this way. It's a very simple st statement about joint probability and conditional probability. But now we have something which looks trivial but is not, which is the following formula, which was mentioned this morning and even before. Okay, and this is called Bayes' theorem. Uh, 
Um, and it tells you as a probability of B given A is a probability of A given B times P of B <laughs> divided by um, um, P of A. Okay, so it's called a Bayes theorem because it was written by by Laplace. <laughs> okay, I'm a bit unfair to Bayes here. So th there is, you know, Bayes never wrote this. He wrote something that assumed that P of B was uniform, and uh, he never published it when he died. Then it was actually published by uh, a friend of his called Price, and uh, he didn't write it this way, but in spirit, this is what he meant. He wrote it in words. So we should probably write, you know, call this a Bayes uh, Price theorem. It was published in uh, 17 uh, something, yeah, 63, I think. And for uh, the publication of this work, Price got elected into the Acad English Academy of Science. Right, so this is a lesson for you. You need to have good friends. <laughs> and help them publish, and uh, then you get a good career. Okay? But the modern version of it, uh, and actually the formula written this way, is, is due to, uh, to Laplace. Wrote it in, uh, a bit later. And Laplace is sort of the godfather of, uh, I mean, of all this inference and inverse probability problem. I mean, uh, it's also a very nice article. By the way, we are discussing about how Shannon article is great, and you can read it in uh, the, the one he wrote in 48. The original work of Laplace is also fantastic to read. It's, it's a really fun read, even though it's you know, kind of old. But you have to know French. It's one of the rewards of knowing French. You can read Laplace in, uh, in original text. Okay, so how does this help for what we do? Well, instead of looking this likelihood, which is a weird quantity, I mean, frankly, this is a very weird thing to do. I mean, why do we do this? I mean, this is not a, this is not a probability distribution of on, I, on X. In doing this, we are not maximizing the probability that X was a good thing at all. I mean, this is a probability distribution on Y given X as a parameter. It's a very weird thing. Okay? In fact, it works extremely well, and it's you know, one of the hammer that people use in statistics. It's a fantastic method, maximum likelihood, but uh, you know, it's actually the starting point of um, frequentist analysis. <coughs> but people who are Bayesians, and I'm the, I, mean, I have no uh, strong opinion about this, I actually like the two schools, uh, it's, you know, that makes no sense. Why does it work? And the frequentists agree. That makes no sense. But we prove that it works. Okay? So the frequentist style is more like to propose things and then to analyze them and to say, look, it works. Which is good. It's perfectly fine. Right? The Bayesians want something more principled. And maybe sometimes it doesn't work as well. So, what does this mean into our uh, problem here? That means that what we should really be doing uh, is to say that the probability that X was a signal, given we observed Y, is actually equal to the likelihood, which is the probability of Y given X, times P of X divided by P of Y. Okay, and so in Bayesian statistics, people give fancy names here. Um, this is called the prior distribution. And what it means is that before any measurement, what I knew a priori on the random variable x is the fact that x was taken from this distribution. Right? So it's a very good name. A priori, before any measurements are made, is really what I know about X. Right? It's taken from here. So I told you that this guy here is called the likelihood. Ah. Right, so this thing, we would usually say it's a normalization constant. Uh, so let's call it normalization if you want. depends on why, so you have to compute it for any kind of measurement. And sometimes people in uh, Bayesian theory call it the evidence 
but I will not go into I'm just writing it for I will not use it one more line and then and this distribution the one that tells you what is the probability of x given the observation that we have done so after we have done the observation it's called the posterior distribution of x Okay, it's a very good name because this is telling you before the measurement what is the probability distribution of x. Then you make a measurement and you have a new distribution which is given by the posteriors. Okay, and the Bayesians used to say that this is good. You're updating your unknown, uh, you know, your description of the world anytime you do a measurement. All right, so this is the basis of Bayesian inference and this is what I'm going to use here. So one point. Why doesn't everyone use this all the time? There's a very good reason why this is not always a good thing. In fact, in many situations, it's a very bad thing. Is that in practice, maybe you have no idea what this is. Okay? And since 200 years, uh, people complain to uh, people doing Bayesian inference. So you have no idea what you do here. So what are you going to do? And uh, this is very good uh, criticism. Uh, so... You, know, you have to think about it, and I would be happy to discuss it, but this is not our situation today. Because I cheated, I tell you, this is our situation. I actually know what x is coming from. It's coming from p of x, and I'm giving it to you. Right, so I would be very happy to discuss the frequentist and uh, Bayesian inference in general, but this is not the topic today. So we assume that we know p of x. Okay? But still, it's very interesting, and Laplace himself recognized this problem, and uh, this is why he actually uh, switched from you know, that kind of methods to, uh, to a maximum likelihood method later on in, uh, in his life. Okay, so it's, it's fantastic read. Laplace was asking questions like, what is the probability that the sun is, uh, will be shining tomorrow morning? And then he gave an answer. There is a number for us. And, uh, okay. Good read. So for those who are interested in that stuff, there is a nice book called uh, Theory That w Would Not Die, How Bayesian Won World War II and, uh, and everything, uh, something like this. It's a very good book. Yes? That is a condition probability. It's y given x. But as a function, is a function, I mean, as a number, it depends on y and x. Okay? Right, what I call like this are probabilities. When I'm giving numbers like uh, small values, these are functions. Okay, so I'm making the distinction between the probability of event B given A and the actual function that is giving me the probability. Okay, if you want this thing, that uh, variable Y is equal to Y and X is equal to, okay, is equal to a function that depends on y and x. And if I want to compute this, I need to tell you what x is and y is. Okay, this is not a probability distribution. And I agree, this is a probability distribution of a y given x. You were the question. Um, good question. The answer is yes. Because you received, you don't know p of y as a function, but you know the value p of y for the measurement y that you received. And it's very easy. You just take this, you integrate it, and you compute the normalization, and this is giving you that. Okay, so you, you know it for one value. And this is all that you need. If you have to do an analysis, a statistical analysis, then you have to average over many values of y, and this is what we are going to do. And you will see that the average over y will be exactly the same as the average over disorder in statistical mechanics. All right. So, what does this mean for what we do now? Well, a good moment to switch board. Good. All right. So, now... Let's write the posterior distribution for our problem. Okay. And it's equal to the exponential of 
square root of x ah sorry square root of lambda x minus y squared divided by 2 pi this is the likelihood that is the prior and I divide it by normalization which conveniently enough I will call z ok and another way to write this is to say that this is the exponential of the log of p of y given x plus the log of p of x ok so taken at value oh sorry there is no vector here because now I have only one measurement ok one uh, th 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 uh, x plus log p x of x alright so written this way the connection with statmec is obvious let me define all that like this so that really looks like a Gibbs distribution with beta equal to 1 so there is no temperature all this thing the log of the, pri of the, po of the likelihood plus the log of the prior that would be minus my Hamiltonian and it depends on the measurement y and the unknown value x and of course this needs to be normalized so I need to divide by z which is the integral of all this with respect to x because it needs to be a probability distribution of x so I call it z of y and this is really the partition sum ok so that whole stuff here it's really an Hamiltonian wow it's minus the Hamiltonian with beta equal to 1 if you want and that's it's a partition sum ok so now why we see that there is a deep clear connection anytime you try to do that kind of problem that's set up that is setting up a Gibbs distribution yes you use that uh, Laplace's yes the base theorem to, to rewrite the pxy px uh, condition on y plus p y condition on x alright so I see that is confusing here ok so this is really the probability of y given x well right but you rewrote p probability of x given y yes I probability the probability of x given y as, okay. as this but what I need on top of this is the prior divided by py and I need also to, uh, to compute the normalization and the fun thing which is a bit different from uh, normal stat mech that the normalization is p of y it's actually changing the subject entirely and making it amazingly more easy as you will see uh, but otherwise that, you know, it's stat mech ok now this is cool for instance if you want to uh, to look for the most probable uh, variable x what should you do? well the most probable is the one that will uh, maximize this probability so if, since this does not depend on x I need to look here and how do I get this uh, uh, large? well I need to have the Hamiltonian uh, not too small uh, sorry the lowest energy yes so I need to pick up the lowest energy thank you right what we call the ground state right so we discussed inherent structure and everything uh, a few hours ago and uh, you discussed imagine I give you a complicated energy landscape what would you do and some of you said well I use some conjugate gradient or some uh, pseudo, new, pseudo uh, Newton method like uh, BFGS and everything and this is what people do here I mean uh, they, they pick it up on the internet and, uh, and they do that kind of stuff ok so this is a good method yes so I'm still, I'm still a little bit unclear I, it's not clear what the goal is because if the goal is to rewrite a stat mech even, the, even without the 
re-expressing as PY condition on X, like the first equality. Could yes. Us that map, you know, I agree. There's some I agree. I'm just, I'm just saying that this is what I want to do, and I will tell you why. Okay. You the want to think of y as the annealed uh, x as the annealed Yeah, I want. I, I will be. I will basically do this. Okay, but forget stat mech. It's clear that this is a good thing to do. I mean, what you want to know is what is. I received y. If I have the probability of that x, you know, if I have the probability description on x given this measurement, this is great. Mm -hmm. Right. There is much more information into this than there is in the likelihood because the likelihood doesn't know about the prior. Okay. Okay. Now, it so happens that it's probability, I mean, then actually I agree. Anything in probability could be mapped to a statmec problem, right? So, in fact, statmec is a terrible name, by the way. There is nothing statistics in statistical physics. It should be called probability physics. We are doing probability theory in, in statmec, but uh, the name doesn't sound great. So, statmec. Okay. Um, so, yes, right? So, uh, if you want to uh, find the most probable uh, value of x, what you need to do is to minimize um, the energy function, the Hamiltonian, okay, which is given by the log likelihood plus the log of the prior. And, um, okay, that's actually a good thing. So this is called map estimation, and Guillaume discussed uh, it this morning. So it's maximum a posteriori. So the difference with Maximum likelihood is in maximum likelihood I was maximizing the likelihood. And here I'm maximizing the posterior function. It makes much more sense. Because this is a probability that x was the variable given what I measured. So I might as well pick up the most probable value of x, right? Okay, and this is arg max of px given y, which is the function of uh, x and the measurement y. All right, and one way of thinking about it is to say, well, what I could do is to put a small beta here and to do a simulation and uh, then take beta going to infinity, which is the same as beta going to zero, and uh, that will give me some uh, good estimate of the ground state, right? And this is what people do. So if you uh, look what people do in Bayesian inference, they're basically just doing Monte Carlo simulation. It's when uh, Monte Carlo simulation comes into uh, Bayesian inference, it transforms the field. And before this, they could do uh, only simple cases, and then suddenly they had this big hammer and they could do everything. All right. Now, this is not obviously the best thing you should do. Why? So let's look at this function. Okay? So let's look at what is this probability of x given y. So y is given. Okay, you have received y equal to 1. Now let's look how this distribution can look. Now, obviously, if it looks like this, then taking the maximum doesn't sound stupid. Okay? Fine. Makes sense. Okay, case one. Now, case two, imagine if it looks like something extremely peaked. and something a bit bumpy like this. Now remember, this is the probability that x was a solution, or the probability density. So if you take the map estimate, you will say, well, I think this is a correct solution. But the truth is, if you ask yourself, is it more probable that x was between here and here, or that it was between here and here, well, the answer is given by the volume of these figures, right? And there is much more volume here, or much more entropy, if you want. So taking the max is maybe not always a good idea. So we need to have a principal way to do this. Okay, so it turns out there is a principal way to choose what to do, and again, it was uh, slightly discussed by Guillaume this morning. What you need to choose, first of all, is a measure of your error. You, want, you need to know what is the thing that you would like to achieve. Okay, and this is coming back to one of the questions of Leo. 
So one thing that we might want to do, for instance, we might want an estimator x hat of y, so again the estimator is a function of the measurement, such that for instance we might want that x hat minus x hat squared is small. <coughs> that would be something good. Right? That would be we want something that minimizes a quadratic error. All right? So can we do this? Well, I don't know to minimize a quadratic error, but I know to minimize it on average. Because given I received y, imagine I received many times the same value of y, I know what is the probability distribution of x star of the truth given I observe this y. Okay? So I can compute something which is called the risk. In fact, it's called the posterior risk. Because, well, because the result is something called the frequentist risk, which I will not discuss today. Okay, and the risk is a function of, uh, well, okay, and it's the average value of the quadratic error that you are making. x at minus x star, okay, and here we need to average over all the possible value of x star given I observed y. Sorry, x star. In fact, I don't need a star here because it's a mute variable. Okay, so this is the average quadratic error that I'm making in such if I use x hat as an estimator. Sorry? Squared, thank you. Okay, there is also something called the Bayes risk, which is the average of this over y. But since I will tell you how to, maxi how to have the smallest risk, I mean, if I have the smallest risk for every y, <laughs> obviously, when you average over y, you still get the best thing. It's very, s it's very c connected to this, yes. Yes, could be. Okay, but uh, wait. The point is that I'm cheating because I know this, right? If you have a complicated process and you have no idea what the posterior is, you cannot do this analysis, okay? So I'm really in a very nice case where I'm assuming I know everything. Okay, but this is a nice case that connected to StatMex, so this is why I'm presenting. All right, so we want to minimize the risk. Okay, how to do this? So I'm deriving with respect to x hat, and I want this to be zero. Okay, I will write it this way because it seems to be here. Uh, okay, so I want this to be zero. So this means that what I should do, that my estimator should be equal to the actual mean of the distribution, not the max. Well, this is interesting. If x is not any variable but, let's say, a spin, how do we call the mean? The magnetization, right? So think about a statistical uh, physics problem. This is telling you that a very good way to have a very low mean square error, in fact, this estimator is called MMSC for minimal <coughs> mean squared error is to use the average of your variable with this Gibbs distribution. So I really denote it as a Gibbs distribution, where the Gibbs distribution is, is this one. Okay? 
or we have a clear connection with StatMec. Any problem like this, if you want to have the minimal mean square error estimator, well, you need to find the magnetization of all your variables. Yes. Yes, you could, and we will be discussing this later on. Or you could have something which, in a so-called paramagnetic phase, will be just as good as any random gases, which is another distribu uh, possibility. Yes. And why do you choose a quadratic form? Or good point. Uh, it's because I like quadratics, but you might want to know what is the best thing, for instance. Okay, a good example is to say, let's say I want to minimize this in absolute value. You can do the exercise, and you will get that in that case, this is not the mean, but the median. And for any loss function, so this is called the loss function, you have an associated risk, and you can minimize it, and you have uh, the corresponding estimator. Okay? And then it's a matter of taste. I mean, I will do quadratic because I like it, but it's in many applications, this is not good. For instance, in finance, quadratic is bad because you, know, you, you really don't want to, uh, to be uh, screwed by... Uh, the large tail, and, uh, and so you might want to uh, to go to larger moments. Okay, but I like quadratic. Okay, now imagine another situation, which will be we shall use as well, when x is not continuous variable. So you know that your p of x is actually taken from uh, well, you know, plus or minus one with probability one half. What should you do? Okay, you can do this. Still can do that. But if something is plus or minus 1, maybe minimizing the difference squared is not what you want to do. What you want to do is to say, okay, look, I want to know if it was a plus or a minus 1, and I want to know what, what is the probability to make a mistake. Right? So what you would like to do, if you have a discrete prior, if you want, is to minimize the number of mistakes. So can we repeat this analysis in this case? Um, Aha. Aha. Okay. So how do you repeat this analysis in this case? So can I ask a question? Yes. You can. So this procedure is, is like doing uh, weighted linear regression? Yes and no. Yes, in that kind of problem, because I had a Gaussian uh, Chanel and, uh, and this thing is sample. Okay. In that case, yes. And for any Gaussian Chanel, that will look like a, uh, not only weighted, but what people would say is regularized. And um, depending on the prior you have here, it could be easy or hard. Uh, if this is Gaussian, this is called ridge regression. If you have what is called the Laplace prior, it's called the lasso estimator estimation. There are a lot of ways to, to solve this thing by gradient descent. But if X is more complicated, well, it's going to be a bit harder. And uh, anyway, the Gaussian channel is not the most the only interesting one, so you can have much more complicated process, in which case, yeah, that will be in that case completely different from linear regression. But for Gaussian channels, yes, it's very similar uh, to uh, linear regression. Okay, so imagine x star is a plus or minus one variable, or any discrete variable. Then what maybe you would like to do is to minimize the number of errors. Okay, and uh, in that case, what you want to minimize, your loss function, if you want, will be sum over, oh, sorry, will be 1 minus delta <coughs> x at x star. Okay, if I got it wrong, it's equal to 1. If I got it correct, it's equal to 0. Now I can do the same, I can write the risk. Okay, and <coughs> okay, for any given measurement y, how should I choose x hat here? Well, it's not so hard, because this is 1 minus the integral of... Um, Well, no, this is, in word, it's easier. 
So this is I, I need to have this thing large enough. Okay? And when is this when this is large? When this is large when x hat happens with largest probability. Okay, so what I should do in that case to maximize this function is to choose x hat as the arg max of p of x given y. So it's like map estimation. There is a tiny difference which I want to mention. Okay, so that kind of analysis is what he calls the Bayesian optimal error. Okay, this is the estimator that gives you smaller uh, possible number of mistakes. Okay, that looks exactly like the map estimator because this is exactly the same as the map estimator in this case. There is a bit of a difference anyway, and I want to mention it because Guillaume mentioned this this morning. If you will not be measuring a value x, a scalar x, but a vector x, okay, the map estimator will be telling you choose the vector x, or if you want in language of spins, the configuration of spins that is the most probable, so the ground state. Okay? If you want here to minimize the number of errors per symbol, and this is what Guillaume was mentioning this morning, you should actually, for each element, compute the argmax of the probability of p of x i of y. It's not exactly the same. Okay? If you have vector, this is a bit different. This is a situation we're going to look uh, next time. Right? Not important for today, but I want to mention. So these are two different map estimations, and uh, that was the one that Guillaume discussed this morning. And if you want to know why choose one instead of another one, well, the reason is, okay, what is the loss function you, you, you want to minimize? And then that's it, you know, you, you write the risk and you see uh, uh, what is the best thing you want to do. All right, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I, I want to basically solve this problem, because yeah, this is what we wanted to do. And let's uh, let's try to write what is going on in uh, into this denoising problem. All right. So I want to tell you one, two, three, three things. Okay. The first one. Okay. First of all. I will not be using this Hamiltonian here and this Z, but another one which is simpler. We'll see why. Right, so our Gibbs distribution, if you want, that depends on uh, X and Y, is exponential minus square root of lambda X minus Y squared divided by 2, square root of 2 pi, uh, p0 of x. Okay? Now, this is a probability distribution on x. Okay, y is given. And so that means that, uh, sorry, 1 of a norm. And so that means that anything which is not x, I can put it back in the norm and redefine the normalization. Okay, so I will write it this way. Minus uh, lambda x squared over 2 <coughs> plus y square root of lambda x and the terms y squared divided by 2 and the square root of 2 pi, I put them into the normalization. That's fine. So, you know, it will simplify computation. Okay, so this is what I will be using. Yes, but y is in there, right? So, it's just a redefinition of my partition. So it's no big deal. You can put a y here just to remember that it depends on y. Okay, so we'll use this one because, well, it's simpler. Uh, and and you will see. Okay, so this is my Gibbs distribution. 
All right, so A. First of all, let me give you a statement which is interesting about the minimal mean square error. Okay? All right, uh, and this is the expectation over y and x star. So we'll use this symbol for the expectation over y and x star. So this is kind of the disorder, if you want. And I will use the standard physics notation with brackets for the Gibbs average. OK? That's fine for everyone? So people usually would use bar for this one. OK, but I was contaminated by mathematicians. All right, so this is the minimal mean square error, right? Because the average of x is the best thing we can do, as I told you. So if I look the quadratic average of this thing minus x star and I average over all possible measurement, I have the mean minimal mean square error. OK, so let me transform that into something that is a bit more uh, uh, you know, spin glassy, if you want. So I will just take the square. What do I get? Well, I have this x squared plus x star squared minus 2 x star x. Now, this thing here we call q. Well, I might as well write it. So, I will call q the expectation of our disorder <coughs> of the average of x over the, you know, the magnetization squared, if you want. I will call m the expectation of our disorder of x times x star. This is telling me how much if you want my estimation is aligned, or my equilibrium Gibbs magnetization is aligned with unknown things that I want to recover. And uh, an x star, well, and I can call q0 expectation over x star of x star square. Right? And the MMSE now looks something much simpler. It will be equal to q squared. No, Q plus Q0 minus 2M. OK? So what I need to do is to compute this Q and this M, and I'm done. Now, let me give you some physics thing about Q and M. If you think about it here, OK, I'm taking the squared of the average value of X. Now, now I will be using replica. Imagine I have two copies of my system with the same Hamiltonian. OK? They are the same system. And in system 1, I compute the average value of x. In system 2, I compute the average value of x. Well, it's the same as computing the square of the average value of x for one system, right? So Q is also the expectation of x in system 1 times expectation of x in system 2. And I have, sorry for those who cannot see, but I just wrote, I am writing here, if you want, this is really the following thing. I'm taking two copies of the same system, and I want to know what is the average color product. OK, so people in, the in replica theory, they call this the overlap. It's the overlap between two replica of the system, if you want. In the sense, Q0 is the overlap between two randomly drawn um, uh, versions of X star. And M is the overlap between my estimation of X star and the truth. It's some sort of 
average magnetization in the direction of the truth, if you want. Right? So if I want to compute the MMSE, I need to know what is the average value of the overlap between two different replicas of the system. Uh, you see that it looks replica theory. And then I need to know what M is and Q0 is. So Q0 is easy because it's you know, the second moment of the prior distribution. These two are a bit harder. Okay, so that's one. Now, statement B, the statement B, maybe I will finish by this, it's like the most important thing I will say in this uh, uh, today, is the fact that whenever we have that kind of problem, there is a magic formula that is coming in, which is simplifying everything. And this is what we call the Nishimori relation, I think it was already mentioned. Okay, they are called like this in honor of Hidetoshi Nishimori, who is a Japanese physicist who uh, discovered them in a completely different uh, setting. And this is it. The expectation over the disorder of the Gibbs average of any function of x and x star. So x is sampled according to the, distribu the Gibbs distribution, x star is sampled from the prior, is equal to the expectation of a y of the average of the same function when I took two copies of the system. So x1 and x2 are both copies of the same systems. They are using the same Hamiltonian. Okay, so it's again, I have these two replicas. And I am, you know, I'm claiming that there is this fantastic identity that tells me that any time I want to compute the Gibbs average of a function between two different replicas of the system, average over disorder, I can just replace one of the copies by x star the unknown signal. Okay, I'm going to prove this in a uh, few minutes because it's really short. But before I'm telling you, you know, this is implying that Q, that M is equal to Q, right? If I take for the function the scalar product, this is really, you know, if F of X and X star is just X star, this is on the left is what I call N, and what is on the right I call Q. Okay, so first of all, <laughs> this is nice. Because now we see that the MMSC is just given by Q0 minus M, which is kind of simpler. And not much simpler, but at least we don't need to know Q. I mean, we, we do, it's the same as M, so it's simpler. And also this is fantastic. And I will be using this all the time. And this is the thing that will simplify everything that we do with respect to the normal statistical mechanics. OK, let me prove it to you. And uh, yes, good. Let me prove it, and then we stop. All right, so let's prove it. So I just need to write what this is. So this is the integral over the joint probability of y and x star of, OK, so this is the integral, okay, so this is the Gibbs distribution, which I tell you is the posterior distribution. Right, so this is nothing else than that. Now I use Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is telling me that the joint probability of y and x star is the same as the probability of x star given y times p of y. Right? Not even Bayes' theorem. I mean, it's uh, the fact that p of a and b is p of a given b times p of b. Right? So dy p of y times dx star p of x star 
given y. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta, and I still have uh, this guy. Dx, p of x, given y, of f of x, and x star. Now, x star is mute. And x2, actually. right? I might as well have called x, x1, and x star, x2. Okay, so if I change trivially these names, dx1, p of x1 given y, dx2 of p of x2 given y, and I have f of x1, x2, and this is exactly this quantity. Right? This is the average over y. And what this is, is the average value of f of x1, x2, when x1 and x2 are sample from the posterior distribution, which is exactly what I use as a Gibbs distribution. So, Yes. Yeah, probably. I mean, uh, I think it's short enough. But you know. <laughs> or what you could do is to use Nishimori way to do this, which is actually finding a gauge transformation, then summing over all possible gauge transformation, then finding there is a gauge invariance, and when averaging over all gauge possible transformation, you find that you have an equality for the magnetization, and then if you work more, you have it also for another variable, and if you do it again for more variable, you find it, and after 40 pages, you find the same. I like this way. I think it's good enough. Uh, here I don't have any mean square estimator yet. But where do you see a mean square estimator here? So what here. The bra angular bracket is a Gibbs distribution. So that means that I'm sampling x from the posterior distribution, p of x given y. Right? This is what I call the Gibbs distribution here. So whenever I'm using the bracket, it means that x is distributed as... Oh, look. Um, haha. Right, so bracket means I'm sampling x from this distribution. Right, and, and this is really p of x given y. It is a posterior distribution. Right, so the only, the really the powerful thing that will distinguish that kind of analysis that we will do here with what you do normally in StatMec is that your Gibbs distribution corresponds to a posterior distribution in the, in the base uh, kind of analysis. And it influences it you know, a lot because it gives you, in you this Nishimori relation. And I will be using them to derive a lot of stuff. You will see that you can use them to derive this Paris difference potential for free without any computation. It simplifies replica. It allows you to have rigorous results. That allows you to prove the replica method in many ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a, a powerful tool. Okay, and in particular, you have Q equal M. All right, so I think I'm, uh, I'm not too bad with respect to what I wanted to say, uh, I, uh, so I could stop here. So you average over x star too. It's yes. Right, so think about the disorder. So what we will call Gibbs distribution is the following. There have been one process that have generated x star and a measurement value y, and now the Gibbs distribution is the probability of your belief of x given this measurement. So this is Gibbs. The disorder is when I average this over many realizations of this random communication process, right? So this is the thing, the thing that will play the role of disorder here. Yes?
Can you hold this question for tomorrow? <laughs> yes. They are always true when you do inference. Okay, I know what you are. Yeah, I know what you are thinking, and I will map this into the P-spin uh, model, to the Shankton Kirkpatrick model, and all spin glass model. In which case, you will need to have very special thing, and this is uh, tomorrow. All right, thank you.